So, as if you didn't recognize them, Hans van Kesteren, VP and CIO Global Functions for Shell. Daniel Benton, Global Managing Director of IT at Accenture. Georg, Senior Director, Portfolio Strategy at HP Software. And first and foremost, uh, Chris Davis, the, um, uh, the Chair of the Forum. So Chris is going to start. So I'm going to introduce Chris uh, very briefly. Uh, as I said, Chris is the current Chair of the Open Group IT for IT Forum. He's uh, a member of the faculty, tenured at the University of South Florida. Well, thank you very much. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. Um, the linkage from the futurology is about creativity. And my role simply today is to explain who we are, what the problem we've been addressing, and the great work that we have been able to put together with the folks in the room over the last two years. So the problem which I've looked at for a time, a lack of cooperation across all of IT leads to what systems thinkers call suboptimality. Much research on software failure talks about not so much catastrophic failure, but how software systems disappoint. I think the sense of disappointment many of you have understood. Secondly, insufficiently integrated IT management lacks prescriptive guidance. So the group came together when they realized that they were all trying to solve what seemed to be a very, very similar problem. They were each trying to be creative in a silo. They quickly realized that there was an opportunity here to demonstrate some creativity. The other aspect of this critical to the success of business was the inability to gain true insight in order to make good decisions. So some empirical research, you know, the scientist in me as a university person these days, that rang true too. And then finally, immaturity in this ever turbulent and ever innovating world makes it virtually impossible to tack complexities like cloud agility, mobility, bring your own device, and all of the other what are now called disruptive innovations. So Clayton Christensen, another man with a Scandinavian sounding name who is in fact another Harvard guy like Michael Porter, came out with this idea. We are confronting it in the IT for IT forum. So this is the dynamic problem that we've tried to address. IT for IT is an evolving open group standard. Today is the launch. IT for IT provides a reference architecture for managing the business of IT, IT management in the broadest sense, enabling insight and also with an emphasis on evolution and continuous improvement. It's our hope and indeed aim that in this way, the new standard will enable IT execution across the entire value chain in a better, faster, cheaper way and with less risk. The Open Group's IT for IT forum is fundamentally vendor neutral, technology agnostic so that we can be responsive and agile and industry agnostic. So we can be vertically and horizontally innovative. That is the broad goal. At the moment, we are made up of two groups, if you will. The original founding members of the IT for IT consortium, representatives of whom are in this room with us. So as the morning progresses, it will be my pleasure with Alan Brown to introduce you to some of the founding fathers, if you will, from the original consortium. Colleagues at Shell, Hewlett Packard, the Dutch insurance business Acmea, Munich Ray, who I don't think we have a representative from here today, Accenture, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and AT&T, all contributed, if you will, the initial stimulus for this. 
and today we are growing rapidly. I'm thrilled to announce that we now have members in the open group IT for IT forum that include Capgemini, BP, Logicalis, Umbrio. I think we have two representatives from Umbrio who are welcome. It's nice to see you face to face, who unfortunately aren't able to stay for the whole week. ATOS, IBM, Architecting the Enterprise, and Microsoft. The work of the original consortium began back in 1911. It was stimulated by a conversation among major customers of one of the vendors. And through the first year, we rapidly moved to, or they, I should say, rapidly moved to the development of a reference architecture-based um, addressing of this problem. So in August 2012, the early phases of the reference architecture, the very early versions, be, were created. Through 2012 and 2013, we moved to the first substantial release. And as you can see, also, we moved through a number of levels. So the architectural emphasis of this, so I'm struggling here to make a pun on the challenge of architecting and gardening the enterprise, but I'll let that go. We have a strong architectural emphasis. This makes sense to an awful lot of existing forums in the open group, not least because we've been careful to pay attention to what TOGAF and the Archimate forums already do. So we have a multi-level structure to the enterprise architecture. And you can see on the timeline at the bottom that that's evolved to the point that we're at today October 2014, when we fully publicly launched this forum, we have a substantial but still rapidly evolving enterprise architecture for the business of IT. What I'd like to do now is to step briefly out of sequence to enable Georg to step up and explain the relationship between our use of Michael Porter's value chain concepts and the reference architecture that we have in IT for IT. Thanks, Georg. Thank you. I certainly will. Um, so first, a very quick introduction. And the reason I'm explaining that is I'm an engineer. So by definition of Magnus, I'm ugly. <laughs> Even though I'm disguised as a salesperson, as you can say so. Um, I will say strange things, very definitely. I'm incredibly intelligent, so you should seek for looking for ideas in this presentation. Okay, now, first, after um, Chris introduced the why we did this, I want to spend a couple minutes to talk about what it is. And again, back to Magnus, who really inspired me this morning to change my complete script. Um, what we didn't do was R&D. In this case, we actually copied a concept that also Chris already introduced from Porter, the business value chain. Um, well, I actually call it steal it, but I don't have to be completely Magnus compliant, I think. So what we did was, in, in, in order to tackle the problem that Chris introduced, we, we needed to scope the problem because you immediately can get into boiling the ocean because IT can be vastly um, expansive and, uh, and capturing lots of problems that we actually do not want to tackle. But we really want to tackle the delivery of IT services to make it better, faster, cheaper, less risk. That's essentially what we were doing. So we were looking at the scoping of how should that look like? What, what's the taxonomy of IT that actually explains that? Now, as a matter of fact, if you ask any customer out there or any vendor out there or any service provider out there, for that matter, everyone has a taxonomy. It seemingly tries to say the same thing, but it does do it differently. There's a different language. There's a different mentality. There's a different semantics implied. So um, now we... Should we invent another one, or um, should we just take a proven concept like the business chain 
and try to scope IT with that. That's exactly what we did. Um, so, but the IT value chain per se is, is, a, is a vast end-to-end -end thing, so we still have to break it down to make it graspable for people. So what we introduced was the concept of, concept of value streams. Four value streams in particular that describe the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, a value stream is defined as a set of tasks that are dependent on each other that add value. Meaning, the bottom line of it is, if the tasks are one, two, three, four, five, then the result is not five, but it's greater than five. Because there's a leverage effect to do it exactly in that sequence with that handshake between the various different steps and the context on which they are executed. That's what a value chain is. The four value streams are strategy to portfolio. So you've got a strategic context, you've got a financial context, you understand what the business demand is, you understand how your service delivery is today, what your portfolio is today, and from that you distill with what you have and what you can do, the set of priorities for the next planning period. That's strategy to portfolio. At the end of the day, you have your priorities. The next phase is you either uh, need to change stuff or you have to build new stuff to actually get to the new portfolio at the set of priorities you decided. That's all about requirement to deploy. Then you have to make it available to your businesses, to your end users, which is request to fulfill, not only the catalog aspect of it, but the whole fulfillment process with all the financial and costing and, and, and usage boundary conditions around it. And the final thing is when now the stuff has been requested and has been fulfilled in the production environment, we have the detect to correct. You want to keep it up and running. You want to keep it up and running at the agreed upon metrics that all go all the way back to strategy to portfolio. So as you can see, to make good decisions in the first place in strategy to portfolio, you have to have understanding of what's going on downstream in the other processes and vice versa. If you do troubleshoot at the end of the value chain, it awfully helps if you understand what was the driver in the first place, how it was built, with which types of requirements, and how it was ultimately um, uh, launched into production. So that is the value chain, and that is what we want to do. We believe that actually really every customer, and we, we talked to about 60, 70 customers over the, over the past two years, I mean all over the enterprise, and we always found that we're solving the same problem over and over and over again. Every customer tries to solve that problem or a portion of that problem and tries to get stuff as a solution implemented, and everyone does it differently. So why can't we find a more standard way and save the market a ton of money? Now that we understood what we want to do, um, we thought about how do we need to do it. And that's where, where Magnus starts to dramatize, right? I mean, this vertical change type of thing. Um, imagine if, if, if you would ask an IT, or IT person from, from 10 different companies for a definition and a model of a simple thing like incidents, and you would get one answer. <sighs> Wouldn't that be nice? Today, you get at least 10. Sometimes you get a novel back with a couple of alternatives. Um, wouldn't it be nice if you take tools from different vendors, um, hopefully also from HP, um, put them together in a value chain approach and it actually works? <sighs> Traumatizing. So at the end of the day, um, going back to, to Magnus again, uh, the real problem that we're trying to solve is to, uh, to decrease murder even further because a lot of IT executive heads are on the chopping block and we really want to avoid that. That's the real reason why we do. Now we get into the, to, to the reference architecture which really does prescribe how this value chain actually should work under the cover, focusing on 
the data side of it. And I want to make that point very distinctly because, and you will hear a lot more about this in the track sessions this afternoon where we talk about positioning and uh, what is the delineation between what we do and what ITIL is doing. We really embrace, and, and not R&D, we embrace um, standards that are out there or de facto standards that are out there with regard to all of the different process definitions that have been done in ITIL, in ISO, in COVID, you name it. So we embrace that. So we look at those landscapes and be sure that our reference architecture actually works uh, with, with these standards as, and is in the same notion. We even include some standards like, for example, TASCA, uh, which uh, primarily works um, down in the, in the reference to uh, uh, request to fulfill um, workspace. That's an existing thing that we do include in, in, in our work. So we really leverage and we get, we get boring on that. Um, so we, we really focus on the data side of it. And now another dramatization. Wouldn't it be nice if an IT executive could come to IT and ask the critical questions that an IT executive wants to ask? wanting to understand where the IT is as a business. How profitable, quote unquote, from an RRI perspective, is my portfolio? What is my security exposure with the various different services that we have? Um, how did the number of tickets decrease or increase over time in a highly multi-supplier environment. Try to answer those questions today without having a consistent set of data that actually leverages, leverages each other and is built as a whole. That's exactly what we try to do uh, with the reference architecture. And you will hear a lot more about this how and the intricacies uh, when you listen to the track session in this afternoon in which we have Magnus still there? A Scandinavian chief architect. <laughs> so we can't really try that, can we? Wonderful. Okie doke. Um, in this, I would like to hand it over to, uh, to Ellen to introduce Hans. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, I'd like to introduce Hans, and um, uh, re interesting story. I, I worked for another Anglo-Dutch company, Unilever, for many years, and a uh, great company. Last weekend, I had the pleasure of a, a London Business School alumni reunion, and one of the husbands of one of my co-student alumnus um, won the... 800 meters in Mexico gold medal in 1968, 88, something like that. And um, he was employed by Shell at the time, and they, they gave him the time and gave him a lot of support at the time. Great company to work for. Anyway, Hans is the VP and CIO of the global functions of Shell International. He joined Shell in 1979 um, into the IT function and uh, found that not exciting enough, so moved into accounting and finance. Uh, but now it's exciting again, so he's back. And he, he came back into the IT function to head up the global functions at the time that the IT for IT idea was born. So um, before Shell, he worked for the, spent time with the UN uh, in Swaziland and Italy. With Shell, he's been in the exploration, production, and chemical areas in places like Brunei, obviously, Rotterdam, which is the head office, yeah. uh, Aberdeen, we all know about North Sea Oil, and Gabon. Yeah. So, uh, very widely traveled, very experienced executive, many years in, in Shell. Please give a big, warm, open group welcome. Hans van Kesteren. Well, that's me. Um, uh, it's a good habit in Shell that we start with uh, seeking a brief attention for health and safety. Um, actually, I missed a bit of the... Uh, lost his mic. Uh, we have a...
situation uh, where we would go. So hopefully you've got the little green signs in your head. Um, one thing I like to reflect on is, um, is something not working? You dropped it. Oh, I dropped it. <laughs> Fortunately, I've got a loud voice. So yes, you're doing well. There you go, sir. Um, I was recently in San Francisco for a week uh, where we visited a number of our suppliers. And in the weekend, I was driven by a chauffeur to Napa Valley, which I can really recommend. Very good wine. And uh, the chauffeur driver was actually, during the, tri the trip, resetting his navigator. And I had some very uh, sort of scary moments. So a plea to you is if you have a navigator in the car, do not fiddle with it when you're driving. It seems trivial. Uh, but uh, you could get yourself in a, bear, a bad car, car crash. The second thought I was, want to share with you before I get into the sort of meat of my presentation, I was linking in with, I guess, what we heard from Magnus. I thought, well, what I'm going to tell, say, talk about is not really about uh, competition, and I'll say a few words about that. It's almost also not really about create, although you could argue we did quite a bit of work uh, in preparing for this launch uh, to date. Uh, but it sits sort of in the middle, because if you can't get your, heart, your, your fundamentals working well, you can't liberate resources uh, to do the real stuff, which will give you a competitive ad or move up uh, vertically. The other thing I was uh, really delighted to hear, I, I was thinking about myself, well, I'm very close to retirement. It's for me very easy to step out of the company and actually do some interesting stuff. So uh, perhaps a few light bulbs uh, uh, and for me to start my own business. I've also had the privilege of being in this business for about 40 years. I still remember the first computer I worked on was in 75. It was a cyber from the CDC company. Uh, it was half a megabyte memory, so it looked a bit like uh, the, sort of the five megabyte drive you saw early on the picture. It used, you, it, you, we had an immense big hole, air conditioned, and that's where this big machine sat. So needless to say that I have seen an enormous change, and I talk to younger people today, I say change is not something of the last five years. Uh, it's been with us for the last 40 years, and that makes it a very exciting era to, uh, to work in. Um, in my capacity as Global Function CIO, uh, I look after 20 functions in Shell. They're all globally organized, and IT actually is one of them, and it's the largest. Uh, and so when I joined, uh, or went into my role, um, I quite quickly bumped into Karl van Zeeland, our lead architect, and he had this vision and, can, and said to me, basically, Hans, can you support it? Because I think we've got a great gap to fill here. And um, he had a very convincing story. And so since 2011, I've had the privilege to support him uh, and the early work on this. And I'm very, uh, personally very excited about that. We are now at the stage that we can launch a forum because my belief is that uh, we need more parties to contribute to what I think is going to be essentially a very important bit of standardization work uh, we need to have. And I'll come a bit back to that earlier on, or later on, sorry. Um, we didn't quite start in 1911, uh, by the way. It was 2011, uh, Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, but it did take some, did take some incubation time uh, <laughs> to get where we are. A full century, that's interesting. Uh, good. I will uh, give a bit of uh, context. I'll tell you a bit about Shell and IT in Shell. Uh, to, uh, I guess, make the business case for us a uh, bit alive. So uh, bear with me. I'll take a few minutes to talk about Shell. Um, and in case uh, you would decide to either sell or buy Shell, Shell stock after my story, uh, you're on your own. That's what it basically says. It's a waiver. <laughs> I will not give you the time to read it, but believe me, uh, we need to put this in. So what is Shell? Now, I hope the technology will work. And it does. Shell is exact, effectively, it's got two parts, an upstream and a downstream part. For those who are not uh, familiar to the oil company, uh, it starts with looking for oil and gas, uh, developing it, exploiting it, and then it goes into the downstream world where you're talking about transition, uh, transport, and bringing it to the market. Um, simple picture, uh, quite complex business if you think about the fact that we drill wells in two to three thousand depth of, of sea. Uh, we put big installations in place in Sakhalin in Siberia. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about some of our innovations later on. So that's Shell in a nutshell. Um, 
uh, it is truly a global, uh, global uh, organization, as you all will know. Uh, we employ about uh, 87,000 people, actually, on our payrolls. If we would actually count all the people who actually work for us, we're probably more than a million. Uh, and uh, we have a tradition of working through many suppliers uh, and will continue to do so. So that's also the case in IT, by the way. Two-thirds of our labor force are from suppliers, and probably even a bit larger. I would like to focus on the 1.3 billion we spent on uh, R&D. Uh, we uh, believe we only have a, a, a competitive place if we can actually keep innovating in the area we're already working. And we have got a, pre, pre, a pretty decent track record, record. If you think about, we were the first to do LNG in any big, big way. LNG is about liquefying fraction of gas, then transporting it to the market. We were the first to do uh, deep water drilling, uh, and so we went to the Mexican Gulf as one of the first players. And recently, uh, we've gone live with a big GTL plant, which is converting gas into liquids. Again, a first. That's only possible if we actually invest significant dollars. IT plays a specific, quite a specific role in there, and we have actually got a separate department doing innovation work, so they're not hindered uh, by the rest of the organization, as it were. That's a bit, by the way, which is intellectual property. We will not put in any kind of standard. That's uh, where we want to compete. But the lion's share of our IT business is non-competitive and, and just good stable, table stakes. Um, the last thing I want to say about these statistics is 3.3 million barrels of equivalent per day. Uh, half of that actually is gas these days. It's probably around 3 or 4% of oil, world production, so it's not that big, uh, but still significant in size. Some people think of us as a sunset, uh, sunset industry, and here is a clear link with, uh, I think, Magnus, is if you just look at some of the statistics presented here, in 2050, we'll have two billion extra people on the globe. We will have probably twice the number of vehicles. A lot of people are not using energy these days, or not substantially, will move into the next age as well. So that will mean that we will double energy consumption uh, in this span of period. Uh, we will have to meantime half our CO2 emissions uh, to keep the environment sober or clean. And we will have to become twice as efficient. Of course, renewables will play a place, and God knows what else. Uh, if I look, think about the, uh, sort of a little bacteria. Uh, but uh, hydrocarbons will take a significant share of that if you just look at the extra extrapolating uh, our demand. So we're very much, I think, a crucial player uh, in um, a sector which is going to be very important for the future of the world economy. There's no doubt about it. And quite a big challenge which will require a lot of out-of-the-box thinking. So how does IT for us sit in Shell? Uh, probably again a few statistics. Um, needless to say that IT for IT in Shell is business in its own right. We spend about $4.7 billion a year on IT. Uh, and uh, you can see from these statistics uh, how sizable uh, the landscape and applications uh, we look after. And the story behind all of these data, uh, I just want to give you a sense of how important IT for IT is for Shell, because it's a significant amount of money, and of course we heavily rely on it as well. Just to pick up one figure, we have 8,000 applications, 500 of them are business critical, which means that if they're out of business for more than four hours, something stops. Uh, and so uh, there's obviously a lot of attention to make uh, sure that uh, we start up within a few hours when we actually have a problem. I think the 20,000 virus attacks uh, per day is also an interesting statistic, uh, just to highlight the challenge we have in that space. Uh, and uh, it's not only virus attacks we're subject to. So uh, again, I think an interesting statistic. So what does uh, this response, uh, what are the key challenges in this world? And uh, just pay your attention to the picture uh, in the background, which is uh, the sprawling city of Mexico, and probably an example uh, w what happens if you lose control of your asset base. Uh, and that's why I've chosen that background. Um, if you look at the key challenges, uh, increasing demand uh, and the growing asset base, we run about 1,000 projects per year. You imagine every project potentially adds infrastructure, adds middleware, adds licenses. 
So uh, that by itself is a big challenge. Uh, a rapidly advancing technology, you've heard a lot of this disruptive uh, technology, which is a word I'm not allowed to use anymore since I've listened to Magnus this morning. But anyway, you are no cloud services, uh, mobility, consumerization, uh, things of internet, uh, think about the in-memory in computing. There's so much happening at the moment, uh, so the landscape is changing dramatically. Increasing number of players, so if you look at the number of suppliers we were working with 10 years ago, we actually our core system has got 12 uh, suppliers. We see that rapidly expanding to all sorts of people who have also got a value proposition for the company. And um, the business has become increasingly dependent on our services. So I already mentioned the example of the 500 business critical systems. I don't have to say much about increasing risks, including cybercrime. You can read about that every day in the, uh, in the week. Um, business requires rapid deployment. It's interesting that we have uh, increasingly IT aware co community uh, in the company who basically demand that we respond to the IT function quickly Otherwise, they'll go out and buy their own solution. And that's the beginning of a disaster, thinking about the sprawling uh, city. Actually, we have quite a number of uh, business-managed uh, applications, and obviously we're paying a lot of attention to that. And then probably last but certainly not least, the increasing cost, cost pressure. Under this growth, we see a huge growth, or significant growth, of our base cost. We've taken a lot of cost out over the last 10 years, but in spite thereof, the base cost rise actually overwhelms that. And as the company is not prepared to spend more than a particular limit, it starts crowding out our investments. So we need to think about a clever way of bending the base cost curve and, um, and making sure that we continue to invest as well. This points at a, a huge integration problem, is the way I would say it. And I think uh, Georg already has given a very elegant uh, example of the connects you have to make in this world. It's interesting that Ironically, I would almost say that we've invested in big ERP platforms for our business with a full integration proposition. However, for IT, we have not put any solution in place. So we're still working with spreadsheets and all sorts of loosely connected applications, struggling to make sense of the end-to-end -end life cycle of our IT products and services. Uh, Shell's IT strategy, uh, very simple terms, uh, has three bands. One is about delivering business outcomes. Uh, the three pillars in that, the technology bit, which is very much the proprietary stuff where we really want to make a difference. And uh, think about uh, seism processing of seismic data, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, of course, we want to deliver our projects uh, successfully and we want to drive value with our existing platforms. And of course, there's a lot about data and process analytics and so on. At the end of the road, the fundamentals are all around making sure we have reliable and secure uh, systems, and you should actually probably add affordable to that as well. And then we cannot do that without people, partners, and a community. Uh, we have, as I said already, 12 ecosystem partners, uh, and I see this as a community as well, which will be complementary uh, to what it is we're trying to do. All in all, I would say that we're taking much more of a, project, a, a portfolio approach than we have had in the past. We used to look at investments, and then looking after them when they sort of uh, matured. We're now looking at our portfolios per function and per business to make sure that we see the cost, the value, and the risks uh, looked after properly, which means that we make a new investment. We also need to take stuff out, otherwise we can't manage our, our base cost. So that brings me to uh, my last and probably most important slide, is what's the case for action in terms of launching this IT for IT forum? And I always think that pictures tell uh, a lot uh, about where it is we want to go. If you think about a sprawling city, that's not where we want to be because that's uncontrollable. Uh, we want to get to a neatly organized town in which we have full control. Uh, think about uh, overall cost, uh, value, uh, proposition, also security. Yeah? So um, we fundamentally believe that most of the work we're doing in IT doesn't give us a competitive edge. And so it makes infinite sense to share what we are doing in this space with other companies. Uh, and so we have started on that journey in 2011. Um, we believe that, um, and I, if you look at the little red diagram, it actually describes in simpler terms uh, what a management system would look like through the full 
life cycle, it's going to be adamant that we have indeed full visibility of cost. And for those who've been involved in creating that in our business, you know how difficult it is. Probably even importantly, maybe even more, more, more importantly, we need to know what value effectively our applications deliver. And then we've got also this um, performance, uh, reliability, and security challenge. So creating a management system around this, we believe, uh, will be a great value uh, proposition, not only for us, but for many uh, in the room. And we're very pleased to see a number of uh, parties already voting with their feet. So in summary, standards will help us mature our industry and deal with the new challenges, which I described to you. It will create a common language so we can best share best practices. It will uh, further uh, advance our professionalism. Uh, and of course, ultimately, and somebody was asking me to how long will that take, uh, we will have a common platform. So if we have a service provided or we buy a bit of software, it all fits in in what we already have. So we don't have to worry about integrating it all. Now that's probably a vision which will be five or ten years ahead. Uh, but I think the benefits of getting into this uh, uh, open dialogue, um, I see, uh, will be quite immediate. And so I'm really looking forward to entering the dialogue with yourselves and really invite you to participate in this forum because I cannot see how you can do without, and frankly. Or you could keep trying to find your own solutions, but I suggest that getting into this arena together with other companies uh, would be of great benefit to your companies as well. So thank you for that. Well done. Thank you. <clears throat> so yeah, Shell has a long history with the Open Group of being a leader from the customer side, uh, right through from the early XBG days, the Unix days, through Enterprise Architecture, TOGAF, and so on. So very, very strong supporter and, and uh, an organization that leads from the front. And uh, very pleased to have you driving some of this as well. So we're now going to move to Accenture. And I'm going to introduce Daniel Benton, who's Global Managing Director of IT Strategy with Accenture, which covers the IT strategy and the IT transformation areas for organizations helping them to improve their performance. He's also a leading thinker around the CIO agenda and sponsors the Accenture High Performance IT Research Program and driving much of their thinking around digital business. Um, he's architected and driven transformation programs for the IT function of several major organizations in Europe and the US and acted as advisor to many clients around IT strategy and governance. So please give a big warm open group welcome to Daniel Benton. <laughs> there we go, that's me, they've got the right person. So, I'm responsible for three things at Accenture. There's IT strategy, which is all around business and IT alignment, enterprise architecture and the practice we have there, and what we call IT transformation, as Alan's just mentioned. We manage those three things together, because clearly one's about setting the direction for technology within a business, the next one's about actually what underlying blu blueprint do you need, and the third one is about how do you get the IT organization then actually fit to execute that? What set of capabilities do you need? All three of those are actually causing complexity at the moment. There are trends going on within each of them that are making life just more complicated. So if you're a CIO at the moment or if you're running a technology company, no big news, things are getting more complicated. And we're seeing, as Georg has said, a consistent set of issues and questions coming out of most of the clients that we talk to at the moment about how do they cope with this world. And that's why we're delighted to be part of this consortium and why we think it's really important. So let me drill into those three areas a little. Um, obviously, we don't believe in digital, having heard Magnus. Unfortunately, most of our clients and most of the businesses that we talk to do. And you can talk about smack convergence, how to apply social mobile analytics and cloud to business processes, how to create new business. But for me, actually, that's not the important convergence in digital. For me, the really important convergence is this complete convergence between the business and the technology agendas. So life used to be easy. There were some business people somewhere that worked out what they wanted to do. And if you're a CIO, you then worked out, well, how much money did you have to spend? What did you need to spend it on? And you develop an IT strategy. And IT was very much an enabler to a business strategy. What we see now is that technology is increasingly actually becoming the business strategy. 
And in the digital world, it's less about, this is what I want to do, what technology do I need? It's about, if I had this technology, how could I create value out of it? And that's driving a very different relationship. And in this intersect between business and technology strategy, we see the emergence of all sorts of new beasts, call them chief digital officers or whatever. Actually, that should be the job of corporate IT. That should be the job of the CIO. Because if you're not driving that agenda, someone else is. You're just being the service delivery organization. So there's an open door there. Um, and businesses are looking for technology to come and create value, to come up with new innovation, to work very closely with them. And from our own point of view, you know, at the beginning of this calendar year, we actually joined our business and technology strategy organizations together because increasingly we realized we were having exactly the same discussions with exactly the same people and exactly the same clients. It's become the same agenda. I'll mention that I run something which we rather grandly call our high-performance IT research. We run this every couple of years or so, and we talk to a couple of hundred CIOs around the world and find out what's on their mind. And uh, we measure the performance, actually a self-assessment thing, against uh, 150 different measures of the way you could measure an IT uh, organization and its performance. And what we discovered when we did this last time is that there are three things that the people who get it right seem to be getting right consistently. See here the perils slightly of moving a four by three slides to a 16 by nine screen, but there you go. Three things they get right together. Innovation, agility, and execution. Now, IT execution is just, can I deliver reliable IT on time, on budget, in a way that works to support the business? That's if you like the table stakes. But as I'll show you, that's actually getting considerably more complicated at the moment. Innovation is really about that owning the debate with the business, helping the business to co-create strategy, new ideas for creating value with the business. And some people are very good at that. Other people are less good. But in many cases, it's not because they don't want to. It's because they can't. And that's where agility comes in as well. Agility is really to say the pace is moving faster than ever before. And in too many cases, IT gets in the way. So how can you respond to a very rapidly changing business environment? How can you run IT differently so that you can be really agile? And the problem that nearly every corporate IT organization has is it's a bit like the Irishman who, when he was asked for directions to the next town, replied, well, I wouldn't start from here. And that's the problem that everyone's got. It's legacy. Um, and it's not legacy just in terms of the architecture. It's legacy in terms of the processes, in terms of the organization, in terms of the people, the skills that you have, the relationship with the business, etc. And the people who are actually performing better and able to, to drive the debate with the business seem to have solved agility, particularly, to start with. And particularly, they are earlier adopters of new technology. They manage to keep on investing when other people weren't. And where they are is they're further on this journey. Everyone now is trying to deal with a hybrid, a hybrid of on-premise legacy, private cloud, public cloud. Let me draw that more simply. On the left-hand side here, you can see this thing which looks a little bit like an alien with two ears. IT in the middle, largely still within the firewall. People are trying with some external stuff in the cloud there, either you know, from an infrastructure point of view or they're trying to use Salesforce or some early SaaS. Everyone is an inexorable journey from the left to the right, moving at different paces depending on which industry they're in, depending on where they started from and where their legacy is, depending on their appetite for risk. But we're moving from somewhere where I used to control my IT, it was within my firewall and I knew where it was, to somewhere where I will still have some stuff within my firewall, I will still always own things, but increasingly I'm going to be sourcing services from outside. Even worse, the services that I'm sourcing from outside source their own services from somewhere else as well. So we have the emergence of service aggregators, cloud service brokers, etc. That can be fantastic in terms of solving your agility problem if you can get it right. But it adds huge complexity. Somehow you've got to manage all of that. Somehow you've got to join it all up. So if you're going to get the agility that the business needs, problem, you've actually got a much more complicated architecture than you had before, and you've got to find a way to manage that. Similarly, from an organizational point of view, if I stick my IT transformation hat on, this picture will be extremely familiar to you by the end of the day. It's the value chain that Gail put up. The way that people run IT is changing significantly. If we look at the planning end of things, as we said, the whole strategy process is changing. It's not about just receiving a set of requirements and working out how to spend the money. It's actually co-creating strategy with the business now. 
And in all of that as well, actually, there are a huge number of ideas out there. If everyone is now multi-source, and if there are lots of new startups out there, all with good ideas, how do I plug into those as part of the, um, as, as part of the strategy process? How do I know what good looks like? How do I then take that into the business value creation discussion? So the planning process, the, uh, the strategy process is changing, but not as much as the delivery process. Now, we all come from a world where pretty much every IT organization that I've ever, um, ever come across has people who build things and people who run things, and they're very different beasts, and they don't talk to each other enough, and so on. Actually, increasingly, the distinction between those two is blurring considerably. And if you look at things like DevOps and so on, or if you look at what we're calling two-speed IT, there are very different ways now of delivering things. Okay? So what I mean by two-speed IT is the fact, you know, it's a traditional waterfall, but there's also now, as well, when we talk about Agile, I don't just mean Agile, the methodology. I mean the sort of set of digital people that come along in their skinny jeans and strange haircuts who sort of do a different sort of IT at a very different sort of pace. And every CIO has to work out how to manage the two of these together because different models for different sorts of projects are actually required. I've talked about incubation and prototyping. The idea that you could come up with a set of requirements and then work out how to spend a large amount of money on it has changed. You need to actually pilot things. You need to start to innovate. You need to incubate stuff, prototype, work out whether it works, iterate as necessary before you work out when to spend the big money. And actually knowing with all of that, when you've got something that's going to work and when you can start to commit big spend becomes a really different way of thinking about your whole investment portfolio. On the delivery side, as we've seen from that model on the previous page, it's not so much about I've got my own stuff and I need to run it. It's now all about service integration. It's how do I run other people's stuff? How do I join it all together? The whole area of sourcing is very different. So the whole operating model has changed, if you like, from one where years ago I actually had a set of people who built and operated my own IP and I own the people, to one where I started to be multi-sourced, to one where I then started to use other people's software and other people's IP. So all of a sudden I had an IT organization which was really trying to use other people's stuff with other people's people. I then virtualize the whole thing through cloud, and I've now got this very complex architecture that I see on the other side. So actually working out how to source that, how to integrate it all, and how to manage it all together is a real problem for people. How do I get transparency of that for the business as well? Hans mentioned now the business is more enabled than ever before to go and get its own services. Um, actually, I need to behave as though I'm Amazon or Salesforce. I need to be able to get great transparency to pricing, understand how to manage all of that, and understand what I'm paying for from my suppliers as well, and work out how I can provide those services to the business and the transparency of the costing underpinning that. Another area on here, we've talked about security. It's not just about cyber, it's the fact that, again, if I don't own my architecture and I don't own my people anymore, and I probably don't own my customers because they're talking to each other, okay, not just to me anymore, thanks to social, um, understanding the whole security profile of what I've got in that very complicated architecture, in that complex operating model as well, becomes really critical. It's the thing I lose my job for if I'm a CIO, but increasingly, it's not about having the perfect firewall around something with 17 lots on the front door. It's about understanding what business risk I'm taking, understanding what I do when risk happens because it's bound to at some point, and particularly understanding across that extremely complicated ecosystem I've now got, where are all the risks? So it's no surprise in a world that is complicated from an architecture point of view, where you're changing the whole relationship between business and technology, and where you're changing the entire operating model of IT, that we see lots of tools popping up all over the place to help people manage this complexity. But the problem we find, therefore, is that you've actually somehow got to get control of all of this whilst actually still giving the agility that the business wants. It's not acceptable to go and say, sorry, you can't do that. Okay? And the business is saying, I can just go and source this. I can buy this with my credit card. Okay? You've got to find a way to be responsive, to manage that ability, to take advantage of those architecture and, and operating model trends whilst retaining control. And that's where IT for IT starts to come in. You need to be predictable and measured. You need to be controlled. Um, you've got to be able to enable these various different styles of IT as well. So I was talking to one of the very large banks recently, and they've been trying to move their entire model, their multi-billion dollar change budget, to the new style of IT. That's not the right thing for them to do. That's the right thing probably for about half of their portfolio, probably less than that. They've got to carry on delivering the legacy. It's got to work. So managing 
several styles of IT together. It's not two-speed IT, it's multi-speed IT, different ways of working, but still join them up into recognizable, um, into an IT function that works where you understand the risk. And what we find is, although there are tools all over the place, historically those have tended to happen in silos. The silos themselves are changing. Those tools don't join up well enough together. But you've got a remarkably complex management problem here. So we're hugely supportive of what's going on in the forum here because actually we just see that this is only going to get more and more complicated. And if we can join this together, that's useful for everyone. It's useful for people like Hans. It's useful for all of the clients that we work for. So with that, in terms of how it's going to work, I'll hand that to Gail. Great, thank you. So yeah, now we're going to look at the HP. Why is HP in the game? And uh, you've seen Gail very briefly. I'll, I'll just run through his bio. Senior Director, IT Management Software Portfolio Strategy with Hewlett Packard. He's previously held director level positions in HP software and strategic marketing portfolio strategy and architecture. That sounds like an engineer. <laughs> he created and led the cross portfolio customer advisory board, which significantly helps of HP software drive strategy from outside in. He's been uh, most recently uh, driving the creation of a lean but effective integration architecture and business model to help HP and the IT customers transform to the new style of IT. He's put a huge amount of effort into helping this initiative move forward. Um, done a lot of work with us, with the group, over the years before we met. Um, and is now a, a, a great contributor. So please give a big warm moment group welcome to Gail Rock. Thank you very much, Alan. Yeah, I'm still an engineer. Now I'm an HP engineer. Um, I still smell bad, though, but to some even more. Um, okay, so why is HP in the game? You know, you, you've heard from Hans as a major customer. You've heard from Daniel as a service provider. And now I'd like to give you the perspective of a vendor, which picks up a couple of the topics that these two were talking about, but also another perspective that particularly I, in my job over the past 10 years, have been struggling with uh, tremendously, and that's integration. Jeez. Integration, it's a nightmare for everyone. And hopefully some of my fellow competitors in the room um, share some, uh, some sympathy with me. Um, and I also would like to ask for your forgiveness as customers in the room. We don't do it intentionally. You know, I mean, it's just a very difficult problem. I mean, IT is such a fragmented market, not only from a, from, from a modeling perspective, from a data model perspective, from a technology perspective, if you look at the various different products. Even, even if you just look at the HP portfolio, and again, um, other competitors can, can uh, uh, chime in here, because a lot of us have been growing by acquisition, right? So. I mean, we, we've had organic investment in our own portfolio, but we saw gaps and opportunities to move to a broader spectrum. Actually, always with the intention, yeah, if we, if we integrate these things, we actually can get to the one plus one equals three type thing, which theoretically you can if you get it right. Now, the problem is we, we, we got those portfolios, okay? Now, we've started to integrate those. Now we get into an architectural problem because all those integrations have been built from customer use cases. So they, have, they are valuable and right in their own right. But now you start transporting a customer use case and the corresponding integrated solution from one customer to another and it doesn't work. Why the hell is that? Well, the answer is pretty simple because, and please ask yourselves, um, every customer that we've worked with has done something like the reference architecture that I've shown earlier. Because everyone creates, out of need, their own information model for IT. 
their own definition of what an incident is, what a service is, from a data model perspective, dependent also a little bit on the tools um, they use, certainly, because be pragmatic. But that's a matter of fact. And actually, in the, when we started um, the consortium, we actually collected the information models from all the various different uh, contributors in here, and we, we, we looked at them. And again, they all tried to say the same thing, but they tell a different, a different story. It's a different language, a different mentality, different semantics, what I already explained earlier. And that makes integration very, very difficult because that has an impact on the tactical requirements, how you actually do that. It's very, very difficult to do, to do integration in a change-resilient change way if, um, if, if you don't have an underlying mechanism. So we build a ton of integration. I always get into uh, discussions with, with customers. You don't integrate enough. And I always respond, actually, we do too much. If you think about the, the various different products, um, how, how many integrations do we have officially in the catalog, which you could order as, as, as products and download? Give me a number. No raising hands. No, give me a number. Huh? 200. Yeah. Who, give, who gives me more? <laughs> That's a little too much. Uh, we've got 450. Actually, some of those integration packages are a number of integrations in and of itself. Uh, because it's different use cases in, in, in one bundle. Actually, it's, it's, it's enormous. If you think about what manpower you have to put in there, not only from a building perspective, but also from a maintenance perspective, but let's face it, all of those products that are in, in, involved in those integrations, they change all the time. And it's getting more difficult if it's not on our, only our own products, but also products from our fellow uh, competitors. I mean, it's very, very difficult because you don't have the heads up, right? So now we've looked at those 450 integrations that we have, and we compared it against the reference architecture and said, okay, which of those are actually really critical and necessary? Now you can give me a percentage number. What do you think? You're cheating. <laughs> you have seen the slides. Come on. <laughs> That's annoying. Absolutely right. 15% of those. So, which means, first of all, we can, we can make this integration mess a lot easier if we can focus on the right ones, which is also a transformation with our customers because we have to make it very aware to our customers that there are certain ways you should construct the value chain, right? Like, like, like a map on which you say, okay, this is the right way you move from town A to town B. Well, some use cases today go fairly strange ways, and uh, that makes it very difficult. Second of all, um, the way we do the integrations. If we do have a, uh, a, an underlying data model, not boiling the ocean with every data artifact that is out there, but the critical data artifacts that actually keep that chain whole. So the backbone, the spine. You can hack off a leg or an arm or the spine is not good. So the spine is the important thing. If we have that, we can make the, the integrations not only more seamless for the customer, but also cheaper for me as a provider because I want to compete with the functional excellence of our products, not how we plumb it together. So that's one of the reasons why HP is in the game, because it makes my life a lot easier if we get the right penetration in the market, if we get the right level of adoption, and that's why we're so grateful to have the open group drive this forward, because we expect a major uptake in the market with driving adoption. That's one part of the story. So the, the ugly sewage type thing. Now, getting in the more exciting thing, um, why is HP in the game also from a top-down strategy perspective? Now, you may have heard um, in, in marketing presentations, not from an engineer like me, um, new style of IT, so all the trends that, that uh, Daniel and, and Hans so eloquently uh, um, um, introduced. Um, 
actually the, the, the architecture that we've built so far as a stake in the ground for the open group to move to a normative standard, we've, we've taken those trends very much into account. For example, um, if we look at the way how an agile world today works, so the, 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 the DevOps side of the house that, um, that Daniel was, was alluding to, um, still we, we, ma we map that against the reference architecture to make very sure that we actually can live up to those requirements, and we can't. So the, the service integration side of the house, so a lot of those uh, services to deliver IT services at the end of the day, they are sourced for the most, for the most part today with different business models, outsourced, hosted, um, out of the cloud, whatever. I mean, but at the end of the day, it comes down to that service integration issue, absolutely. And so we've made sure that the real essential data artifacts that you need in order to do that service integration are in the spine. So but there, there went a lot of thinking in, into that. But let me get back to one thing that I, that, I, that I mentioned earlier. Wouldn't it be nice to look at IT and ask those critical questions from an executive top-down perspective? Again, you have to have the spine underneath. And if you look at uh, how IT evolved, over the, over the last couple of years, uh, primarily, you can clearly see a move from the workflow process aspects, and there's a lot of investment has gone into IT, rightfully though, um, now to data and analytics. Because of the need, it's no longer about the doing. We can, do, we can get the doing right in some sense, but can we optimize the doing? That's the big question. Because Hans is all about taking cost out, but where to take it out exactly? Where, where does it fall down? So you have to have the perspective top down to say, where am I at any given point in the value chain? Like you do in the business in a supply chain. I mean, you know very well what is your requirement to move from step A to B. Is the supplier coming in? This good coming here? Blah, blah, blah. Manufacturing. Good example. You know that very well. In IT, very difficult to be done. So that's what we are after. That's where we need to go into the data aspect and combine all of the various different angles. So we at HP believe in, in looking at various different aspects of IT from three different perspectives. We look at it from a systems of engagement perspective, which is pretty much the traditional way. So the workflow, user interfaces, the doing of it, um, implementing all of the various different steps, which leads us to, let's say, something like a tool chain, right? Now, the tool chain can be improved, made more efficient, if you have a system of record underneath, like this spine that I was talking about, um, that, is, that, that is whole in nature. But now, putting the two aspects together um, on top with a system of insight, not as a separate thing, but as a leveraged activity. So the system of record can actually bring quality IT data, and that's what we're lacking today, integrity and quality of IT data. It's not that we don't create good data in the first place, but it's, it's, get bad, it's getting bad through the doing very, very, very quickly. That's why we have to bring the system of record and the system of engagement together to then build the system of insight and top to drive the right decisions. That's what we're really after at HP from a, from, from a, from a um, strategic perspective here. So um, as Alan mentioned, I mean, we've, we've been in this game for, um, for a number of years now, which hopefully gives us a little bit of a head start. Um, so we, we translate it the work that has been done in, in the consortium and now in the IT4IT IT forum into an HP uh, reference architecture that really caters for that new style of IT. And we've been working with a good number of customers over the past two years to actually test out this architecture. And it has proven to be a really, really good, and I really compare it to a map. So you can pinpoint very, very quickly in the discussion with any customer where the current problem is. Pinpoint there, and then go from there. And you, you can very easily construct a roadmap from that first problem, the most critical one, 
to a value-oriented delivery of IT down the road. That's how we use it to drive transformation and road mapping um, with our customers. That's the ex external side of the house. There's also an internal side of the house, outside in. We use the reference architecture actually to drive adoption with our products and drive the underlying systems of record with our products into the right direction so that we are compliant with that spine, which again tackles the integration issue that I alluded to earlier. Uh, furthermore, um, we've taken the reference architecture and actually um, tried to make it real. So we did reference implementations for all of the various different value streams with our products, also with other components out there in the market, be it open source or um, things that are prevalent um, in, in the market, uh, which first of all um, gives us implementation guidance, so we've written up some of those best practices and provided to our customers, so that's how you should do it. That way it actually does work, <laughs> uh, but it also obviously um, gives us a gap analysis because w w we're not compliant everywhere. So we have to look at and be, be, be honest with ourselves, I mean, where don't we meet the requirements of the reference architecture, which in turn creates requirements for our products um, in the adoption. So that's how we go about it at HP, and I hope this has given you an, an insight into why we are here, not just for the fun of it, even though it is, um, but uh, there's real business reasons for us to be part of the game, and we are very excited uh, to work together, together now with a broader group um, to, uh, to make this real in the market and really drive to a better world. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I invite our speakers back on the stage, please? <clears throat> it, pardon? One more slide. Yeah, we'll do that later. If we can uh, get everyone back, we've got a microphone here. We can share. That's all right, I'll take that one. You, should, you have the comfy seats. So, Dave Lounsbury, our CTO. I've got a few questions for you. So, uh, somebody writes, okay, I'm sold. So, but how do I get this in my shop? You know, do I look for trained people? Will we get bids from cloud providers or something else, you know, tool chains? How do you see this manifesting itself in the IT marketplace? Well, I think we're a bit early for that, aren't we? Okay. The first thing to do is to get involved. Absolutely. Um, where we are at, at this moment is clear possibility. Um, these guys have identified the opportunity. I've tried to explain to you the momentum. The Open Group now holds all of the collateral. What we need now is help to fully birth what we've husbanded over the last two or three years and create through the Open Group's ecosystem a way of moving this forward. So what we're looking for is increasing the momentum so that we can actually bring this fully to fruition. So the, the, the key point is that it's, it's not as fully baked as it might look. Um, there's a lot of work to do and obviously the, the value of being engaged in the process uh, being involved, being able to influence it, uh, is still very, very strong. Yeah, I mean, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, I, I do have my mic. Okay. Oh, okay. Working. Um, the, the, the work we've done so far, um, I guess, proves the point. Um, and we've got a lot of guidance material. Uh, we now would like to get into the phase of normative um, standardization, which then... Uh, drives product adoption when we ultimately get to the value. But even today, just using the guidance of the reference architecture as this kind of map that I was talking about earlier is value in and of itself. At least I can, I can assure you from, from various different customers who've improved their way of looking at the value chain and, and, uh, and, and having the various different functions working with each other, 
already tremendously without even any product um, type thing in the in, in, in the game. So there's there's actually already quite some value in there. But ultimately, yes, we need to drive adoption in the market. That's that's what the next steps is all about. Perhaps yeah, I can add that uh, if I look at the roadmap for our IT for IT uh, sort of solutions and process and data interventions, we are already guided by this architecture. So we don't have ready solutions yet, but it helps us think through what the logical order is of replacement software applications, what kind of database uh, we need to create, uh, and also start working on across the sources of data in that context. So it already provides handrails. Obviously, it doesn't really uh, produce a, a finite or finalized product, uh, but uh, it does a lot already for you, uh, I think, uh, with quite immediate payoff. I think the key point, maybe. The reason we're here today, launching this for the Open Group, is because we see this as a pervasive issue. It's one that we've all been working on individually as well as together. And um, you know, this is about if the world is getting continually more complex. Actually, the more people that we can plug into that, both from the uh, from the software point of view, from the service provider point of view, but also from the the end user point of view as well. Actually, hopefully, we can turn this into a standard because. Life's only going to get more complicated. There'll be more things popping up all over the place. And if we can find a way to integrate those around a common taxonomy, around a common data model, hopefully we're in a plug and play world for everybody. Yep. So this uh, sounds like a good initiative, but is this only for a really large IT shop like Shell? Or will smaller companies benefit from this? And if so, how? Well, again, I, I, I can start since we've been working with customers using this reference architecture. Um, let's say that you, you, you might be able to get the biggest effect with larger customers, but it's very much applicable to any size customer, and we have been using it almost with any size customer um, in, in the market. Actually, um, if, if you look at um, one of our um, fellow consortium members, Munich Ray, for example, mm. um, it might be a good example because even though they are a very big company from a revenue perspective, but the way they do business, actually the IT is very, very small. Very, very focused um, around very few critical applications and business processes that they drive, like, for example, underwriting in, in the reinsurance industry. Uh, but they, they use it in exactly the same fashion um, in, 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 in their organization and uh, are a good, good example of the diversity of, of applicability that we can drive here. I mean, we work with lots of very large corporates. They've all got this complexity problem. It's a big problem for all of them. But actually, as you say, as you start to look to smaller organizations, they're often more extensively sourced. They're often using more services in the cloud. They've all got the integration problem that we spoke about. So this should be applicable at all levels, I would have thought. Can I look at our supplier community, both IT and non-IT? Uh, they need to talk with us. Uh, so, and partly, it's IT talk. So, uh, it's immediately relevant for the smaller players in our ecosystem uh, to get their minds around this integration challenge as well. I think the, the models that Daniel and Hans presented sum it up in terms of the shifting ecosystem that is IT. <laughs> At the end of the day, the standard is going to help us work together to choreograph all this. So it's almost, you know, there's a, 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 an analogy with, with the music that the first speaker made this morning. But the world is just going to continue to get complicated. So the, the, the standard will have an, in, an increasing value as that process of innovation unfolds. But I, I think the key thing is that you're talking about small uh, organizations. There are gradations of small. So small, very small organizations, it's, it really is going to be not that interesting. But relatively small organizations, relative to Shell, yeah. That's right. I to say, even for a small 50-person standards organization, yeah. that, that you can see all of the phases in the, in the reference model and, and what you do already. We have a much more organized than we have a complex model. infrastructure, yeah. So how is the work of IT for IT different from the work of, of uh, COBIT under ISACA and how to manage and govern the uh, enterprise IT? Again, me? Okay. Um, so first of all, there will be a very good track session yes. um, in the afternoon with uh, Charlie, sitting over there and Lars sitting in the back. 
the famous Scandinavian chief architect that I introduced earlier. Um, and they will talk about the positioning of IT for IT in very detail um, with um, ITIL, COVID, and, and other standards. Safe, not to uh, uh, forget here. Um, but in, 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 in general, um, so we are really about the information model underneath. We're not about the process side of the house. We embrace those definitions of capabilities and, and KPIs on top. We do. Uh, but what we want to build is how the data actually moves in that value chain, what is owned, where, where you can uh, change things, how you integrate those things underneath, which is not specified neither by ITIL nor COVID nor ISO. I'm laughing a bit because I was uh, talking with Carol yesterday about what kind of questions can we expect. This is one of them. So I'm very happy that you're here to elegantly respond to that, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, that will be covered in more depth. Uh, I, would, I would add to that by saying that they're highly complementary. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. But again, back to the notion of choreography and so on making these things work together. So governance is a key part of the IT for IT work. Um, but in the session, you'll have Charlie Betts and Lars Rossen explain the relationship a lot more fully. And again, we're at a stage of maturity where in the collaboration portal, we already have assets that can be picked up by people, a white paper on the relationship between ITIL and the IT for IT forums work so that you can see exactly where we are in terms of our own perception of positioning. So we've got some substance, which we would be very keen to share with you. So uh, have you given any consideration yet to how IT for IT uh, may play a role in other of the activities going on at the Open Group, particularly things like the uh, Open Platform 3.0 work? There's a, there's a lot to think about there. Um, there's some, obviously, uh, connections um, at the end of it in um, dependability through assuredness, uh, measuring those things. Uh, architecture will come through. Um, the, the open platform, the, the, the integration of social, mobile, big data, cloud, internet of things, all of those things will have some relevance. And, like any other forum, the IT for IT forum will be encouraged to have meetings with other forums of the open group and, and share opportunities with each other. In, in addition, I, I did have it on the slide, but I didn't really yeah. talk to it. But uh, the, the reference architecture, when we, uh, when we started building that out, we were certainly using concepts and methodologies out of the COGAF um, definition. And we're using Ar Archimate to actually uh, uh, specify uh, the, the level two and three of, of the uh, of the reference architecture. I do also think that there might be a good opportunity for um, communication between IT for IT and TOGAF to, to maybe add a couple more aspects into the TOGAF methodology. Maybe I'm dreaming here, but, um, but a, a lot of what manageability means, so non-functional requirements in IT, I think could better be architected in, in, in the very front to make life a lot easier downstream. So if we bring the concepts of security, manageability into architecting applications from, from, the, from the start on, uh, we may make um, operations downstream a lot easier. Uh, not my cat, though. But. <laughs> We're trying to get to the final slide, <laughs> uh, just so we can cover that. And <laughs> Communication is a challenge, but um, Martin's cat is um, very beautiful, but no longer with us, I think, is it? So have you got that last slide, Martin? So we just cover that. Um, one last question, Dave, because we've got okay. to keep people on time. So have you considered the, uh, the convergence of I, uh, IT and operational technology in the IT for IT model? And the new IT and operational technology organization has to handle both traditional enterprise IT and operational technology tasks such as you know, control systems and SCADA and things like that and the interfaces in between. Is that part of the, the model you guys are looking at? The answer is yes. There's another white paper 
on the way that we address DevOps, Agile, and the concepts that surround it. Our subject matter expert is very well known. It's Charlie Betts, who's the author of the book on this um, material. Um, he relies in his book on an analogy with um, those of us that have had builders in the house, you know. We are now making shoes for the cobbler's children. We're catching up. And those concepts are built into the underpinning ideas that have been driving IT for IT in the last 12 months or so. So the answer is yes. And again, we have materials on the collaboration portal that people can see. So I think it's fair to say that the genesis of this has come out of corporate IT, if you like, and how oh, we manage sure. that better. But yes, if you start looking at Internet of Things, if you start looking at census, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, one of the reasons for the launching this as an open group forum is precisely so that we can start to expand the scope of it as well. Absolutely. So yes, there's a, there's a lot more that we could do, I'm sure. I have to imagine that Shell has uh, concerns about more than a few, uh, few SCADA and operational control systems uh, yes. in its IT portfolio. Absolutely. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks, Dave. So the slide up there does tell us a little bit about what's going on this afternoon. And tomorrow in the open session, so tracks this afternoon are open. The session tomorrow is open, and then the next six months is where the work starts. <clears throat> if anyone wants to get involved um, and participate in this, whether it's to learn, to be part of the process, or to influence the direction and the content, um, if you're a Platinum or Gold member, you have entitlement already. Uh, if not, then uh, you can join as a silver member of this forum. Uh, if you're already a silver member, you might want to go to Gold. Uh, but everyone is very welcome. This is the launch event. We're hoping that people join. And we're looking forward to, again, another successful customer-driven uh, activity such as we've had um, in the past with the Open Group. Now, before you guys leave the stage, um, the final part of the launch, if we can do a few presentations, that would be very nice. So I'm going to move that way down, Steve. You can, yeah, you can help Steve, but the first thing is that Steve's got to help me because the first presentation is to yourself as the chair. So thank you very much. So if I hand that one to you, and it's a cheruti. It's like a very nice pen. It's a nice brand. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Anna. You're welcome. <laughs> so... There's a number of people we'd like to thank, so we'll, we'll go through this in the remaining three minutes that we have. So, um, Chris, if you'd like to award um, to Hans on your right. Well done, Hans. Thank you for everything you've done in supporting this. To Daniel. Well done, Daniel. Thank you very much. Gail. To Gail, great amount of work. Uh, Charlie Betts from AT&T. Charlie, are you there? Come and, come and get some. You've done a huge amount of work here. Richard Arning from, what's that say? Acmea. Acmea being new members of the Open Group because of this activity. Dwight David from HP. You come up. There's Dwight. I need some glasses. This is hopeful. Right. Can you pass my glasses? <laughs> I used to get accused of being able to write and put microfiche out of business, but... <laughs> so that's Sue... Sue Desiderio? Desiderio. There you go. Oh, I should have known that. I didn't need to read that. Felipe Genest from Accenture. Great 
great work. Linda Kavanagh from HP. <laughs> Lars Rossen from HP. Rossen. Keys van van den Brink from HP. <laughs> and finally, the person that is responsible for all this trouble. The evil genius. <laughs> the evil genius. Carl van Zeeland from Shell. Well done. So the Open Group IT for IT Forum is now officially launched. Well done. One other person to recognize, of course, is Martin Kirk, the forum director. <laughs>